Well, if there's anyone that needs no introduction to this pulpit, it is Jonathan Jarbo, and despite the fact he has already had an introduction from Jonah, that doesn't mean he's not going to get another one. By the way, in passing, uh, our youth minister, Jonah, is going to uh, stand before an ordination council this afternoon at four. He's presented himself for ordination to this church, and should he pass that and be recommended to the church, and should the church agree, that ordination service will be held at 1045 here on June 26th when his uh, parents are in town from the mission field, and we look forward to that, should Jonah pass muster in the next few hours. Dr. Jonathan Jarbo served this church in ministry capacities for 26 years, 19 of them from 1999 to 2018 as the senior pastor. Last week I said that everything that is good and God-honoring and effective in this church is on account of and as a blessing from the Holy Spirit, but most of all of that, the Holy Spirit has used Jonathan Jarbo to shape and to catalyze uh, most of what Pathway is today and her distinctions are a result of the, of, of the ministry of Jonathan Jarbo. He is the husband of Tammy since 1987. She has uh, also served as worship minister of this church and continues, as you know, regularly to be part of the worship ministry team, and we are so appreciative of that. They together are the parents of three grown children and five grandchildren with a sixth on the way. We just welcomed one grandchild, uh, gra grandchild and another is coming. His children have been uh, productive and fertile and busy. <laughs> He is the graduate of uh, California Baptist University. After today, I think we're going to add to the bylaws that one of the prerequisites for being the senior pastor of this church is to be a graduate of California Baptist University. He is, and also his uh, crowning educational achievement is his master's from Gateway Seminary. He also has, though, a master's of business administration from the University of Redlands, distinguished university right around the corner. And I am Sad to add, he has a terminal degree, a doctor of educational ministry from Southwestern Seminary in Texas. We want Dr. Jarbo to know that he is welcome to this pulpit. He always, it's, it's his, but that having a terminal degree after a first degree at Gateway from another seminary is a forgivable offense, <laughs> but it is still an offense. So we welcome Dr. Jarbo here, his return accomplished and forgiven. Would you give a warm pathway welcome to Dr. Jonathan Jarbo. God bless. How about now? There we go. Well, it's so good to be here this morning. I just want to say that uh, Tammy and I, uh, we love you guys. Uh, we love this church. In fact, in 1986, in the summer of 1986, Tammy and I weren't married, but we joined this church on the same Sunday. I'm curious how many of you were here in 1986? All right. There, Josh? Where's Josh? Josh, Josh, you're right. There's some old faces here. Uh, Josh, uh, Josh said there's new faces and old faces, and I was wondering where we fell in that, so we just determined that. Uh, Tammy and I joined this church in 1986, and shortly after that, um, I felt God's call on my life to ministry. And uh, we moved to Northern California, where I went to, to Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. And in 1993, we came back to Redlands and I joined the staff as the student pastor and a year or so later took over the administrative role of the church and then as Dr. Shao said in 1999, I became the, the pastor at Pathway where I served for several years. I love this church. Tammy and I raised our three children here at Pathway and you have had such a profound impact on our lives and on the lives of our kids. Thank you. We will be forever grateful for the impact that you've had on us and our children. 
This morning, I want to talk about legacy living. It's an interesting phrase. Sometimes the term legacy is used in a negative term, and I've heard it used about churches, a legacy church. And that's code for it's a dying church that's not going to make it. I don't really care for that term. I think it's an inappropriate term. Today I want to talk about legacy living, and that applies to all of us. Whether you're 15, 55, or 85, we all have a responsibility to live with our legacy in mind, making a kingdom impact on the world in which God has placed us. See, legacy living starts right now. A lot of times when we hear the term legacy, we think about sometime in the future. But creating a legacy, a biblical legacy, starts right now. We all make intentional choices to ensure that we'll have a legacy, to ensure that the kingdom of God expands in the future. Years ago, I came across a quote that I love. I've I've used it many times. It's from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a, a pastor of the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in London for 38 years in the 1800s. And Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Let that sink in for a minute. There's only two options for you. Only two options for me. Either to be a missionary or to be an imposter. Now I know last week we prayed for some of our global partners. The week before we prayed for some of our global partners going back to the field. And when we think of missionaries, that's what we think of. We think of our global partners who live somewhere across the ocean in another country and they've given their lives to tell people about the good news of Jesus. And that is a missionary. But all of us are to live daily as missionaries pointing people to Jesus and expanding his kingdom. That's legacy living. Living as missionaries, all of us have that responsibility. Today I want us to examine a passage passage of scripture that gives us three truths about what it means to practice legacy living. In other words, living as authentic missionaries. See, if you're not living as a missionary for Jesus Christ, Charles Spurgeon said you're living as an imposter. There's only two options. Now, We live in a unique time. It often feels like being a devoted follower of Jesus or practicing legacy living. It feels like it's becoming more and more difficult. It feels like with all that's going on in our society, it's just getting harder and harder and harder. And I know we've had two years of craziness in our world. I know we had an unprecedented election. We've had related turmoil, political unrest. Uh, Now we're in the midst of a war. uh, There was inflation at home now. It's a global economic crisis. And on On top of that, uh, we went through a season without a pastor. It feels as if things keep getting worse. But here's what I see as the good news. The cultural, moral, and political shifts in our country are requiring us to either be stronger in our faith and bolder in legacy living, or they're causing us to back down from our faith. And I actually see that as a good thing. See, I don't think you want to throw in the towel and neither do I do, neither do I. I don't think you want to live as an imposter and neither do I. Friends, what's taking place in our culture and our society is nothing new. Read the New Testament. Some of the same challenges we have today were in the first church in the New Testament. We can find this same dynamic and tension with the first believers in the first church. Yes, times have changed, but legacy living has always been significant and costly. There's not a time in, in, in history that it's been easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ if you're going to be a real follower of Jesus Christ. And if you are a follower of Jesus you have a responsibility to be his missionary, to show his love to the world around you. See, casually following Jesus, that's code for being an imposter. But legacy living requires a serious commitment and a significant level of obedience to what Jesus teaches. 
So let's read out of Luke chapter 14. I want to read the whole passage beginning in verse 25 to verse 33 from Luke chapter 14. Follow along as I read. It says, great crowds were following Jesus, and he turned around and said to them, if you want to be my follower, by the way, that's legacy living, being his follower. If you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of the building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if there's enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of funds. And then how everyone would laugh at you. They would say, hey, there's the person who started that building and ran out of money before it was finished. Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 soldiers who are marching against him? If he's not able, then while the enemy's still far away, he'll send a delegation to discuss terms of peace. And then verse 33, Jesus said, so no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. Now, there's a lot in that passage there. See, legacy living, by the way, is not heroic Christianity. Legacy living is basic Christianity 101. Inviting your neighbor or your coworker or your friend or a relative to church isn't heroic Christianity. It's basic Christianity 101. Sitting down with a coworker and sharing the gospel is not heroic. It's not extraordinary. It's what's required of every follower of Jesus. Serving Jesus with all that we have and all that we are is what's required of those of us who claim to be Christ followers. Just read Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's the words of Jesus where he he instructs all of us and he says this. He says, tell people about me everywhere. Where? Everywhere. And then he goes on to say in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. See, Christ has called every single one of us to be missionaries to the world in which we live. That includes your home. That includes your neighborhood, your workplace, the school you go to, the gym you work out, the sports your kids participate in. That's your Jerusalem. It includes being a missionary outside of our own community to Judea and Samaria is what Jesus says. That's why we tell people about Jesus in various places in North America. That's why we partner with one of our mission boards in the North American Mission Board to plant churches all across North America. Legacy living also requires taking the gospel to places around the globe where people have not heard the name of Jesus. I'm grateful that Pathway has a heart for the nations. And years ago, Pathway sent out Peter and Donna to the Middle East. And since then, have sent out numerous families. And and we started establishing mission homes for our missionaries to live in when they come back on stateside. And for years and years and years, Pathway has had a heart for the nations. But what does it take for you personally and me personally to practice legacy living? How do I make sure that I move from living as an imposter to being a true missionary for Jesus? So let's walk through this text this morning. Legacy living, I'm gonna give you three three truths from this passage. Legacy living, first of all, requires me to give up control of my life. Now let's just pause for a minute. All of us want control. All of us want control. We want to control our own destiny. We want to control everything that happens in our lives. But our lives are not our own. The text we read earlier, Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. So what was Jesus saying here? Was he saying we have to hate our families? No. However, 
We must realize that our lives belong to him and we have to give up control of our own lives for the sake of the gospel. If you've been on a short-term mission trip, and many of you have over the years at Pathway, you recognize that you give up control. You make plans, and then you get on the short-term mission trip, and they change. You give up control of your life for that time period. Things rapidly change, and you have to be away from family. You'll eat different foods, sleep in strange places, participate in new customs. When you go on a mission trip, you don't hate your family, but you're willing to sacrifice time away from your family. And give up control of your life for the sake of the gospel. Jesus was teaching here that legacy living will require giving up control of our lives to Jesus. You know our kids serve in Southeast Asia. And by the way, they got there okay. Tammy and I have FaceTimed with them a couple times in the last couple days. It's been about 11 a.m. here. And about 2.30 in the morning there. And our grandchildren are wide awake. They haven't done the time change well. So we've been FaceTiming them at a great time for us, terrible for them. But they made it okay. Now, they serve in a place where it's illegal to proselytize. Now, in the country they live, there's like five recognized religions. Christianity is one of them. Every citizen on their ID card, it says what, what, uh, what religion they are. It's virtually impossible to change religions. And it's okay to be a Christian there. It's just illegal to proselytize. About a month and a half ago, one of their partners got arrested. Two of their partners got arrested. They called it a visa violation because they were sharing the gospel. One of the partners was deported permanently from the country. The other was a national partner that's still there. They just hassled him a bit and then let him go. They, they incarcerated him for like two weeks and then deported the national partner for telling people about Jesus. Now, I watched our kids several years ago in 2016 sell everything they owned, their mattress, their furniture, everything for the sake of the gospel and move across the world. And they live far from us. In fact, when they told Tammy and I where they were going to go, Tammy, um, she said to me, she said, she gives teary-eyed and she said, our kids are going to move across the world and raise our grandkids on another continent. And I said, hon, that's what we taught them, and that's what Pathway Church taught them, and they're just responding to God's call on their life. And she said, yeah, but I don't like it. Our, kids are, our grandkids are gonna be far away. So they got tickets about three or four weeks ago to move back to Southeast Asia the following day I bought tickets to go to Southeast Asia later this fall to see our grandkids. Now, here's, do, they moved across the world for the sake of the gospel. Do they hate us? No. But they love Jesus more than they love the convenience of being close to family. They love the gospel more than they love the convenience of being close to family. Tomorrow, Dr. Schaus, I hope this will make up for my degree from an unnamed seminary that you're against. Tomorrow, Dr. Jeff Orge, the president of Gateway Seminary, and I will sign an endowment agreement together. It's called the Karen Watson Memorial Scholarship And it's an endowment agreement we've created and just a church in LA helped fund it and now we're raising funds for this endowment agreement to create a scholarship at Gateway Seminary in Karen's honor. I wish I would have brought, I have a handwritten letter from Karen, a copy of it, and her picture in my office. I have a picture of Karen we can put on the screen. Let me see if I can pull up her letter. Karen was... uh, one of our missionaries, an international board missionary, who served in Iraq. She was from a church not far from here in Bakersfield, one of our sister churches. And in 2004, the vehicle that Karen was traveling in, along with some other missionaries, was ambushed, and she was murdered. What our IMB missionaries do, our our sending agents, what our missionaries do in, in training is they write a letter to their family and their pastor that's only to be opened in the event of their death. 
And I have a copy of Karen's letter that she wrote to her pastors in 2003, one year before she was murdered. And if I can, I'd like to read it to you. I have a copy of this on the wall in my office. And tomorrow we'll create a scholarship in her name for people to go to Gateway Seminary who are training to take the gospel to the nations. So Karen wrote this letter on March 7, 2003, and she was murdered about a year later in 2004 in Iraq. She said, dear, dear fast Pastor Phil and Roger, there were the two pastors at her church in Bakersfield, you should only be opening this letter in the event of my death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place, I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory was my reward. His glory is our reward. One of the most important things to remember right now is to preserve the work. I'm writing this as if I'm still working with my people group. I thank you all so much for your prayers and support. Surely your reward in heaven would be great. Thank you for investing in my life and spiritual well-being. Keep sending missionaries out. Keep raising up fine young pastors. And then she says in regards to a memorial service, keep it simple. She has a couple suggestions about who can sing. And then she quotes the missionary heart in her letter. And she says, care more than some, care more than some people think is wise. Risk more than some people think is safe. Dream more than some people think is practical. Expect more than some people is po think is possible. And then she says, I was called not to comfort or success, but to obedience. There is no joy outside knowing Jesus and serving him. I love you, and I love my church family. Karen gave her life, like many others, but more recently gave her life in 2004 for the sake of the gospel. When Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, that's what he was talking about. Ephesians chapter 5 says, look carefully then how you walk, not as wise, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Are we living in evil days? Of course we are. But Paul tells us to use our time wisely as Christ followers to point others to Jesus. We have to give up control of our lives just like Karen gave up control of her life, just like many of our global partners have given up control of their lives for the sake of the gospel. Here's the second truth from the passage this morning, and that is legacy living requires me to let go of my resources today and in the future. See, I'm truly a missionary for Jesus Christ when I let go of everything I have to him. You see, we give our, our resources through the local church today and we plan for tomorrow through biblical estate planning. It's one of the things the Baptist Foundation does. We've done estate plans for many of you. The Baptist Foundation did Tammy and I's estate plan 15, 20 years ago. When our kids sold everything they had and moved overseas, for a short time, I got a little impressed with them. I was like, wow, that's impressive that they're giving up everything. And then I read the scriptures and realized that Jesus demands that same level of commitment and that same level of sacrifice from each of us who are truly his followers. That's legacy living. Here, listen to what Jesus said in, in, in Luke 14 and verse 28. 
Jesus said, but don't, count the, don't begin until you count the cost. Now, Jesus had a crowd following him at this point, and he was trying to weed the crowd out. He was basically saying, hey, turn back, go home. This is going to cost you more than you want to give. Turn back and go home. So he said, don't begin until you count the cost. He was saying, don't stay with me until you understand it will cost you everything. And then he went on and he said, for who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if there's enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of funds. And then how everyone will laugh at you. They say, hey, there's a person who started that building and ran out of money before it was finished. Now, we've all seen construction projects that stalled because it seems like they ran out of money. They didn't plan well. They didn't count the cost. Well, Jesus wasn't giving construction advice here. This was an analogy. Jesus was saying that imposters, we use Charles Spurgeon's word. Jesus was saying that imposters, fake Christians, they hold everything really tight and they never follow through on what God's called them to do because they can't let go of their resources. Imposters hold everything really tight. You know it's work to hold stuff tight? It's stressful if you hold things tight. It's stressful to hold your resources like this. It's a lot of work. Jesus was saying if you really want to be his follower, if you want to be a true missionary, an authentic follower, you have to live with a loose grip on everything he's entrusted to you. And friends, it's a lot easier to live like this than it is to live like this. See, when you count the cost, as Jesus said in this passage, when you count the cost, you realize, hey, I I don't own anything anyway. It's all his. It belongs to him. And so we have to live with loose hands, with a loose grip, willing to give everything for the sake of the gospel. The last two Sundays, we prayed for global partners, global partners who live like this, who've given up everything in terms of worldly possessions to move somewhere else in this world for the sake of the gospel, and they've understood what it means to live with a loose grip. Do me a favor. Would you put your hands in front of you? Put your hands out like this. Would you say this phrase after me? Would you say, God, everything I have is yours? Let's say it together. God, everything I have is yours. Friends, that's how we're to live every day. That's how we're to live, with a loose grip, realizing everything we have belongs to God, for his, and it's for his purpose. I've not always understood and lived this principle. My parents taught me at a young age to live with open hands. My parents taught me at a young age to live with a loose grip on the resources that God's entrusted me. They taught me to give and tithe. But I've lived like this a portion of my life. In the last 10 or 15 years, God's been teaching Tammy and I just to live like this with everything God entrusts to us. And it's been freeing. It's been liberating. It's allowed us to be a part of God doing some pretty cool things because we're not so busy trying to hold everything so tight. So in this area, when it comes to your resources and what God has entrusted to you, are you living with a loose grip? Or are you holding on tightly to everything God has given you? Friends, it's God's stuff anyway. I mentioned Karen Watson and this scholarship we'll create tomorrow. There's a church in Los Angeles that received some money through an estate plan, several hundred thousand dollars. And they're going to give the seed money for this scholarship that we're starting tomorrow. And then we're going to try to raise several hundred thousand dollars to build this scholarship so we can provide resources for some students to go to Gateway Seminary who are training to take the gospel to the nations. Jesus said in Matthew 6, store your treasures in heaven where they'll neither become moth-eaten or rusty, where they'll be safe from thieves. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart 
and thoughts will also be. So how do we store up treasure in heaven? It's simple. By using our resources to get people into heaven. That's how you store up treasures in heaven. Use your resources for the sake of the gospel to point people to Jesus. There's a third truth in this passage this morning, and that is legacy living requires me to passionately offer my skills, talents, and abilities to Jesus. Now, immediately, I know what happens when I say this. Some of you think, I don't have any skills, I don't have any talents, I don't have any abilities that Jesus wants. Wrong. Every single follower of Jesus Christ is uniquely gifted, talented, and endowed with incredible abilities. All of us. That's what the Bible teaches. In the text this morning, Jesus discusses bringing our skills, talents, and abilities together to get the job done. Let me read the last couple of verses. He said, or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 soldiers who are marching against him. If he's not able, then while the enemy is still far away, he'll send a delegation to discuss terms of peace. So in the last section, Jesus wasn't talking about construction, and and he's he's not giving us instruction for military action in this passage. He's using an analogy to make sure we're all willing to bring our skills and talents and abilities, to bring everything he's entrusted to us together to work together to accomplish his work and defeat the enemy. That's why he says in verse 33, so no one can become my disciple without giving up, what word does he use there? Everything for me. So what gifts do you possess? What abilities do you have? What talents are you good at? And then along with all the other members of Christ's body, we combine them together to get the job done. I have no medical skills and zero construction skills. But I have led multiple mission trips from Pathway Church. I've led medical teams. I've led several construction teams to do relief effort after an earthquake or to do other construction work. But I can organize. I can lead. I can administrate. What I did for those teams is I, would, I handled all the details so they could do their work. That's my giftedness. It's what I, I do well. While I was on these trips, man, I handed nails to those gifted in construction. I moved wood from point A to B. I fetched tools. Well, on a medical mission trip, I handed out medication. I'm shocked they trust me with a medication. But I handed out medication to people. I negotiated through a couple conflicts so those with construction skills, those with building skills, those with medical skills could get their work done as efficiently as possible with the circumstances we had. And each of you has skills and talents and abilities that God wants you to use as his missionary right here and around the world. I'm not to look at everyone else's gifts and compare myself. I'm to use whatever gifts God has given me to be his missionary wherever he has placed me. That's legacy living. I'm to passionately offer my skills, talents, and abilities to Jesus, and so are you. I love the way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 12. He said, now all of you together are Christ's body. And each one of you is a separate and necessary part. You're all necessary for God's work to be accomplished here through Pathway Church. Every single one of you has a role to play right here at Pathway Church. And you also have a role to play for God's word, the gospel, to be taken outside these walls into our community, across North America, and around the world. Every single one of us has a part to play as a part of God's larger body of Christ to take the gospel around the world. So let's go back to that quote I started with. Are you living as a missionary or as an imposter? Let me wrap this up and make it very clear. 
I'm challenging you today to give up control of your life, let go of your resources to fund kingdom work, and to give Jesus your skills, talents, and abilities for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus said these words, so no one can be my disciple without giving up everything for me. God's asking you to give up everything. Maybe your future plans. Maybe what you thought you would do after college graduation. Maybe what, to give up what you thought you would do for a career. Maybe to give up what you thought you would do as you head into retirement. Maybe to give up what you thought you would do with the resources you've, you've accumulated. He's asking you to give up everything for the sake of the gospel. I'm excited about the future of Pathway Church. The future is bright. You have someone coming in just a few weeks to preach, to hopefully become your new pastor. He's a friend of mine. Tammy and I love Josh and Elizabeth. I think they're the perfect fit for Pathway Church. I think they're going to lead Pathway Church into the future. And God's going to use them in a way to build this church into a disciple-making, mission-sending congregation right here in Redlands. The future looks bright, and God wants you to offer yourself and everything you have to build what he's doing here and around the world for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for your word and for how it speaks to us every time we read and study it. And Father, I pray right now that you would use your word to challenge every person here to be willing to give up everything for the cause of Christ, to take the gospel to a neighbor, a coworker, or somewhere around our globe where people have never heard the name of Jesus. Father, I'm, thank, I'm thankful that you saved me. I'm thankful that you saved so many of us. And Father, help us to realize you brought us into your kingdom so now we can point other people to you. Father, I would pray for those here this morning that have never given their heart and life to you. Father, I pray in this moment you would challenge them to open their heart to you, to seek forgiveness for their sins, and to turn control of their life over to you. And Father, we pray all these things in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.